Good evening, good evening everyone. I just want to see if everybody can be seated and we're going to get started with the program. First of all, welcome everyone to Bus Boys and Joyce at Tacoma. Thank you for coming out tonight to this really important conversation. I'm just really glad that we can do it here. I want to thank you, James, for your suggestion. And that uh, we have the documentarians here, people that are documenting this uh, conversation because we know it's historical. We have two individuals here, James Early and Roy Lewis, especially Roy Lewis, because he is the focus of the conversation, talking about his life and, and reporting, documenting the important it's not many important images of the African diaspora history. And then we all know James and his commitment as well to African diaspora history and heritage. So we, this should be a very interesting, I'm really looking forward to this and the conversation and the questions, the questions from the audience. So uh, we're very proud to have everyone here. Uh, my name is Carol Rhodes Dyson. I'm the art curator for Bunch of Boys and Poets. Uh, I am the one that puts up and installs at the exhibitions in all the nine locations and also develops the Art and Talk Tuesdays that we have uh, twice a month. Uh, I'm a graduate of Howard University, HU. You know, go back. And now I'm a faculty at Howard University. And uh, also a graduate of the Royal Institute of Medical Design and Curatorial Practice. So I'm really glad to be able to uh, do what I love and uh, work with the people, because that's the thing with us boys. We have arts that we really try to reflect the community and community issues. So let me uh, introduce, let's get the program going. Let me introduce uh, James Riley, although I imagine most of you all already know who he is. He is the former director of cultural heritage policy at the Center for Folk Black and Cultural Heritage at the Smithsonian Institution, where from 1984 to 2015, that's a long time, yes. what a blessing, what a blessing. He served in many positions, assistant provost for educational and cultural programs, assistant secretary for education and public service, executive assistant to the assistant secretary for public service, and uh, the Director of Cultural Studies and Communications at the Center, Center for Folk Life Programs at the Center for Folk Life and Cultural Studies. And he was Interim Director of the Smithsonian Pentecostal Museum. He previously served as a human administrator of the National Endowment for the Humanities, producer, writer, and host of 10 Minutes Left, a five-year weekly radio program of cultural education, educational and political interviews, uh, and commentary as uh, at W2R FM Radio Howard University and a research associate for programs and documentation at the Howard U Institute for Arts and Humanities. He received a BA degree in Spanish from Mole House. Yeah. Yay! Okay, okay um, and did doctoral research at Howard University where he researched Latin America and Caribbean history. I know he'd like to move on. To, yes, I know. I know, but one of the things that I have always recognized about James is while he's highly accomplished, he's also highly accessible. You know, I remember when I first met him 20 some years ago and how helpful he was when I moved here from Kansas City, Missouri, and how helpful he was in trying to help me to get established. So, accomplished and with the people, and we, we appreciate that. So, James, in turn, is going to introduce Roy Lewis to you. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. One more time. Good evening. Good evening. So I want to thank Bus Boys and Ports, and I particularly want to thank uh, Carol, uh, who immediately took out this idea. But so reflective of Roy Lewis, this is, we, we have a little dilemma here. Uh, I wanted this to be an interview of an extraordinary treasure, not only in the Washington community, but across our nation and across the black world. And that is the photo documentarist, uh, the photo real as uh, Askir Mohammed, the late Askir Mohammed referred to him 
Roy Lewis. When Roy turned 82 years okay. of age, a uh, few several months back, <laughs> Nanny Kilkenny, former director of public programs at WHUR and former director of the program in African American Studies at the Smithsonian Institution, someone rooted in our community called me and said, James, we need to celebrate Roy. So it was Nanny Kilkenny through me, then to Carol Dyson, then to Roy, and I said, well, Roy should be interviewed by the National African American Museum's photography department, because his work is work that is a reflection of community, Niani being one of those voices that responds. Uh, his work is a reflection of the black world. We're gonna talk about this that tonight, something that he really wants to engage us in. And then I said, and the Library of Congress should be doing this interview, and I should be sitting in the audience. Well, Roy pushed back and said, no, I want a conversation with you, Kenny Gurley. I don't want an interview. So this is going to be an improvisation. I could say a lot about Roy, but we have given a handout that will give you all of the background details. It's coming. You can go on the, you can go on the internet, and you will find extraordinary uh, uh, documentation about him. Born in 1937, and here's where documentation is not always clear in Sibley, Mississippi, although some say it's not just Mississippi, but Sibley is in an incorporated area, I think, outside of Natchez. Lived on two plantations up until I think he was five years old. Now think about that. In our midst, someone who lived on a plantation, most of us talk about it historically, we have those references. Uh, but they are academic, intellectual references for us. So I'm hoping that he has some memory about that. And then he moves to Chicago, but actually before Chicago at age 17, uh, he is setting type press for the local newspaper in Natchez, and then goes to Chicago and introduces himself to Johnson at Ebony, and I think it was your mother or your grandmother. Godmother. Godmother. Again, community, these connections in community. The famous photograph of Theolonius Monk, uh, I don't know, we'll, I hope you will say something about that uh, tonight. Uh, the thriller in Manila, which he not only photographed, but filmed, uh, which became a part of a major documentary. Uh, Duke Ellington, Sterling Brown, uh, you name any number of principles in our community, uh, he has been a part of that. But I'm gonna let you go through that material and you will find that background information because we wanna get into this conversation. And the first way, I want you to just talk about coming out of Mississippi and any memories of plantation life and you gotta get into a conversation. Uh, a lot of memories. Uh, I was born on a plantation. The name of the plantation was Shieldsburg. So you know who owned the plantation, right? in Mississippi, and uh, I was there for about three, maybe going on, yeah, three. But I remember the plantation, I remember what happened on the plantation. My uh, mother and father were the sharecroppers, and so that was, this was in the 30s and the 40s, so we had World War II happen, which was a lot going on, a lot of people going away to the war, and plantation life is rough and hard, but I also remember my mother doing karaoke, my father doing quartet rehearsal on the plantation. And I remember 39 having one of the biggest growth farms in Mississippi, icicles. I remember the icicles hanging on the front porch. So the memory piece is I have that. I mean, that's 39, I was two years old. And so, so. I'm fortunate in that I can remember that. I, I didn't just read that off or something. But I remember that. That's very important these days in time because memory, right now, I'm going to tell you this, your most important possession is your memory. Your memory is who you is. You lose your memory and you, you, you're here. You're just here. You're existing. But as long as you have the memory, and that means memory talking to people about your memory, talking to people who you all grew up together. I've lost a couple of very 
you know, I lost one of my ends. That my football was quarterback, so I lost one of my ends last year. And we, we, we talked every week. And so we moved from one plantation, Shieldburg, to Oakland. Oakland was owned by the Mazik. The Mazik family is the Dr. Mazik here in, in D.C. His plantation was called Oakland. They had two plantations. They were three of them. They had two plantations. China Grove and Oakland. And this is the Mazik school right up here on uh, uh, 13th Dr. Street. Dr. Yeah. Right, who, who Harry Belafonte was yeah. married to married his, his wife. His, his wife. Right. 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 Married to his wife. And he had an open down in the, down on the bay. His place down on the bay was open. So what we all owning a plantation? Well, that's who got a lot of stuff. Can we go home on the Just take the historical note. So you, you finished high school and you moved to Chicago. How old were you? I left. I went through high school. Went through the school system in Natchez. Finished high school uh, when I was eight, 19. And then my godmother said to me, who taught Mr. Johnson. I went from one Johnson to another. Bill Johnson on the newspaper in, in Natchez. And I worked there as a almost vocational training because I selected Freddie here. And so the Freddie, I was able to work with the print shop. It's then when I got the opportunity to work with Johnson at 19 years old. He hired me himself because my godmother told me to tell him all. And so I got the job. And that, to me, was probably one of the most important pieces. Thank you. Because to get that job, that changed my direction in life. So, you go to Johnson, you start working there, but you, then you went to the military at some point, yes? Well, after a few years, the military caught up with me. <laughs> I went into the military, that's where I got my first year in camp, in 1961, in San Antonio, Texas. And I had been really good, I started photographing when I was in high school. But all these years in between, from 56 to 61, five years, I mean, I really was thinking about it. I go to jazz, Concerts and jam sessions in Chicago, poetry readings, and it was sort of like a pair of a friend of mine at the time heard me talking about photography and bought me a family of man book, which is one of the most important photography books that exist. Family of man, every site can put it together. There's an exhibition in the book that traveled all over the country, about maybe 300 photographers from all over the world dealing with the family of man. Uh, birth, growth, work, life. And so as I looked at that book, I could see that the power of the God. So the history makers and other documentation, again, you can find tons of stuff online written about work. Uh, it says that the photograph of the Alonis Mock was really what so Maybe before I got the assignment from Jet. It was the official Jet assignment. Go to the right way to read it. I think all sides of the concert, that's where they had concerts. And I went in, met them on this month, and took the photo. They ran one picture. That was my first picture. Yeah. And then I began to do other stories and jets. I did one cut of Oscar Brown Jr. with the Blackstone Rangers, opportunity to do uh, that. That was 67. William Brooks, Oscar Brown Jr. working with the Blackstone Rangers to produce a play called Opportunity to do the Great play. What kind of money did you make? <laughs> See, I said didn't pay a lot of money. <laughs> but I got the cover. That was the jet when it was a small jet. Mm -hmm. A small jet. Yeah. And getting a weak space in jet was like a poetry because that's when jet, the photography, the photography was the main piece in jet. A weak space. You got a weak space. So, you know, now, again, it became entertainment. But Johnson experience, that whole experience of being there, I think as I began to move around the country and tour and my exhibition, I would sometimes get in late back on from the road over the weekend. By the way, my first exhibit was right, major exhibit was right here in DC. At the new school of Afro American Door, October 1st, 1967. Memory, October 1st, 1967. Gas and Field was celebrating the second anniversary 
for the new school of natural birth control. Uh, Leroy Jones at the time, uh, Leroy Jones, Don Lee, all of them, those are the names of those people now. Now they're here, we were out there, in our group. But they all came in to celebrate this occasion. And so that was my first exhibit. The exhibit was well done. It left here and went to Pittsburgh. Ed Ellis was in Pittsburgh, then to the county called in the New York, and then back to Chicago at Southside and Garson. What was the name of that exhibition? Black and Beauty. Mm. Black and Beauty. And it was an attempt for me to show at the time what was going on, which is the core of my, my work. It's about what's going on in the community. What's going on with the poets? What's going on with the artists? What's going on with the politicians? What's going on with the church? This is my community. I, when people talk about it, it takes a good to raise a child. Me, that's me. Because I had a rough time coming up and the village helped me get to what I need to have to do what I need to have. It's a challenge for me. Saw potential that I could, could not even see every time because I wasn't that wise. But he saw potential and, and he gave me an So, you know, when I think about Ebony and Jeff, I mean, the visual dimensions are very, very powerful. And of course, Jeff was like encyclopedic about what was going on uh, in the black community and then changed to the black world. Uh, it was also about the entire black world. But there were other things going on in Chicago, these extraordinary musicians and painters. But talk to us about that. The AAC Organization of Black American Culture in Boston, the visual arts, and then Hort's writing workshop. Those were people. Point four. Point four. Oh, people of Digest, Made of Black World, First World. Point four, who was really kind of like the Dom in the literary world, because he would present writers and, and scholars to the world that people didn't know about. I mean, he, he never got the credit. And if there was any way to republish those people of mm. we would find out that the literary world, the literary world, the art world, Hoyt was a very serious person, and he recognized talent. He could see it coming. And he gave a lot of writers, a lot of musicians, a lot of artists their first art, their first, first poem in the song which is very important for somebody to do that in a national publication. Were you doing photographs of uh, people with the wall of respect with Jeff Donaldson and those folks at Rossi, uh, Don Aldini? I really, I really thought that I, I needed to cover everything. Deep down in my heart, it was a sad kind of thing. I had a feeling that this was not going to continue. We're talking about the 60s. 64, 65, 66, 67. And I just had, somebody needed a record. And, and I, I wasn't just documenting. I was involved. I never saw it as a sideline. I'm sort of just looking at these things happen. I was in it. I put myself in it. I didn't want to be in one of those people and say, well, yeah, you were there. But you, I was in it. I was a part of it. You know, I did some reading and preparation for this. Uh, one, I went back and looked at the Steve Muhammad uh, article about you just maybe several months before we died. Yeah, it was maybe three or four months before. And I was real surprised that you called me and he said, Jim, get like you would comment on there. And then, so I want, I want to read one of my quotes and then I want to read a quote by someone else that just really um, makes your work so present, I think, for all of us and, and this narrative runs, runs through it. So I wrote, I said to him, Roy Lewis's primary concern has been to be a real organic part of local, national, and global black community, and to be a participant, but also to be a mind's eye of reflecting the most resonant, expressive dimensions of our lives. Then I was reading someplace, and I ran into uh, this note about an exhibition uh, at Tougaloo College and the Mississippi Museum of Art by Revelle Hearn, who's curator of arts and civil rights, and this is her quote. Everywhere with Roy Lewis, the exhibition at Jackson State University, the gallery features photographs from Lewis's career, including historical moments and the everyday lives of black people. 
she views the exhibit as a, quote, gentle reminder, unquote, of black culture and what it means to be black. What it is, is a mix of things. It's family, it's aging, it's celebration, it's music, it is black power. You see some protest and you see some resistance, but that's just the fraction of it, she said. So you have really been embedded. When I think of photographers, and often when we talk about historical photographers, we talk about them in their vertical profile as extraordinary individuals. But you've always had this social sort of horizontal integration. I almost hate to say with your subject matter, because I'm not sure that you look at us as subject matter. Well, yes, I did. I, 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 I made a great, I made a great, great, great subject matter. And the thing about it is that, you know, like to be there when Stokely began to popularize uh, black pop, to be there that night that Baldwin was sitting on stage and Stokely was speaking to the cameras, black power, you know, black power. You know, to be there at that moment, or uh, to be uh, at a demonstration in Chicago, in Gage Park, where I had just left Mississippi with the various march, Dr. King and the various march. And I'm from Mississippi, so I know about being scared in Mississippi. But I was much more scared of engaged part with what was going on out there the day Dr. King got hit in the head with the rock. I mean, I actually was there and, and there were cherry bombs being thrown by the crowd. You had children out there, you had people screaming obscenity, uh, obscenity. And you had nuns out there. It, it was the voice of America. Kind of reminds me of J6, as a matter of fact, and I thought about it. But, but it's the worst aspect of a country when you are not given the respect of your having the right to demonstrate or the right to protest. And to be in the middle of all this, you know, I remember how what Chicago police said, defend, something about protecting the family. Yeah, I was out there in the middle of a demonstration where this young black woman was sitting down with two kids on her and police arrived. Yeah, really, really arrived. I won't go into some of the detail. But, you know, it's, it's a responsibility that I felt as a person from the community to capture what was going on and share that with the world. But then you will be seeing a little later fest out. It was something that I went to, I was a part of it, I had two, two prints in the children, along with a lot of other artists from all over the country. There were nearly 500 artists from America, that were musicians, writers, poets, and 16,000, probably closer to 20,000 people from all over the world. So we're going to come to Pest Act, because right. we're going to show some images. Yeah. But let, let, let me ask you this work. How many photographs do you think you shot? A million dollars, I have no idea. I know it, let's say this, I know it's over a million. Okay, so I, just, I know that. And, and I, I just, one of the books told me, she said, boy, you should never run out of film. And so that's how I see it. She was aware. She was aware. She was aware that I did documents. And her first, her looking at black and beautiful for the first time, uh, she wrote a comment that, that she considered to be a trailblazer. She considered me a trailblazer. And, and in a way I was, laid and trail. Because I think my work reminded her of what she wrote. So black and beautiful, tell us about that exhibition. It was, it was an exhibition of Afro, uh, identifying with Africa, uh, poetry readings, musicians, that John, famous John Coltrane was in that exhibit. Uh, poets, writers, musicians, and events. Events. Yeah. Sort of like the texture of what was going on at that time in 1665, 64, 69. I think that they were from 63, 64, well, actually 61, because Duke Ellington did a piece, you know, you never hear too much about this, called My People. Yeah. 
It was a tribute to the 100th anniversary celebration of, of our being free from 1861 to 1961. It was a 100 year celebration called My People. I photographed it at McCormick Place. Ellicott was there, it was fantastic dance, music, all going like a television production. Ellicott was there, I photographed it, and that was in that exhibit. So the deal was to take what I had photographed up at that time. And by the way, I collected that and put that exhibit together at the same time we were working on the wall of respect. Tell us about the wall of respect. Summer, I know that everybody here knows Summer it. of 67. I was invited to do, the, to do this exhibit here, May. 67 in Detroit, Gaston Neal at the meeting. So I had a black Madonna, I met Gaston. He invited me to do the anniversary exhibit here. So between then and October, the Wall of Respect was created, which I photographed, which I documented, two photographs on. I documented the development of that, and then Ebony, after it was dedicated, the piece you saw in Ebony it was written by Laurent Bennett. And then I did the photo. So that was a busy summer. Your first camera, you said you bought when you were in the military? Right. What kind of camera? It was a Ryko. Ryko, 43 millimeter. Ryko with a bed. It was a Ryko, 43 millimeter. Kept that camera for nearly three years. That was my only camera. So the technology has developed over the years. You and I were talking earlier about improvisation. And you said, yeah, improvisation occurs also mm -hmm. with photographers. Can you talk to us about how you dealt with the change in technology? Well, I, I kind of love film. I still love film. And even now, I try to even shoot digital. It's a matter of lighting. If you can manage the lighting, you can create the film aesthetic. Film has an aesthetic. I don't think digital. Digital don't have the same aesthetic as film. Film comes from the earth. Film comes from the earth. Dye, yeah, silver, down, it comes from the earth. And I tend to think that earthly stuff, the earthly stuff is a little more heavy than the, than the electronic stuff. And I'll say this, I'll call Terry Cotton. You may have, well, some of the people know who Terry Cotton is. He's a folk singer from Chicago, who was, we almost made it, we used to go see Jerry on Sunday. So, but he had a PhD in program. Last time, one of the last times I saw him in DC, he had a PhD in program from the University of Illinois, and he became Muslim. He told me, he said, Roy, the digital work, you can't get the high notes of a digital and digital, digital music. You can't get the high res of code color in digital because it cuts off. And basically, I, I like that area up there where Disney is and the bright colors are. Because why settle for less? You know, I mean, if, when you work at it 60 years, I mean, why do it with it like it's something that's, you gotta move it to, a, to another level. That's what musicians do. That's what writers do. That's what artists do. That's what people who are chefs. That's what people who cook. See, I think the whole concept of, of art needs to be brought. I think the chefs are uh, 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 artists. I think that people who dance are artists. I think that it's, it's a way of life. Photography for me, once it became part of, I was even photographer before I got the camera. Because I was really taking pictures. In my mind, I was just, oh, that's a nice picture. That's why I got the book. So, Estia refers to, refer to you as a griot. Right. Uh, I refer to you as being embedded in our community, almost a visual sociologist. Uh, do you see yourself as an artist? As a And talk to us about that. Philosophy. That's what I want in my brain. Philosophy. Because when you approach anything with a simple philosophical base, means that you have studied, you have your information about it, it's what helps you make it, create what it is or be able to get to the point of what it is. In other words, these guys out there taking pictures, you know why they keep taking a lot of pictures? Because they're at war. That's, they want 
these two guys on stage, the lighting is such a way that they want that. It's one or two shots. Find the right one. That's, that's what they're looking for, is the right one. So is it fair to say that when you take a shot, a portrait, uh, either an individual or a crowd shot, that there's an essay in there, there's a narrative? I'm looking for the essence of that moment. I call it freezing moments in time. That was a quote of James, uh, James, not James, James Brown. Not James Brown. Another James. Not that boss. Not that one. But no, no, he asked me, he was doing an article on a book called River Road I've been working on for 100 years. And, and he asked me, well, what's the, I said, it's the freezing moments in time. Which means that you're quick to stop in time. So you see a storyline, but we, those of us who may not be familiar may just see an image, but under that is a storyline. Under that is the foundation of what it is, who it is, how it is, what, how big it is, how small it is, how beautiful it is, all those things, and sometimes you look David Jackson, who took the pictures of them and took he was a photographer at Johnson. Mm -hmm. And even before I got a camera, this is like maybe 58, 59, we had Christmas party at Johnson. And he took a picture of me in his hospital lab with a 190 or 180. And he gave me a copy of that. He knew I was interested in photography. You can always tell somebody, even a young child, when I see kids, I say, you're interested. Because it's, you know, they, they're, they're interested. And that's what you go with, the interest. So he took these. Christmas and he gave it to me. And he showed me an aspect of myself I had never seen. Whoa, wow, that's me. Interpretation. One of the biggest parts of photography, we talk about the power of photography, is interpretation. What someone was made an editor. And what I asked them, they were going to be evaluating my work. And I said, What is your aesthetics? Is it going to be your aesthetics or my aesthetics that you judge my work? You should always use some of which means you've got to know the aesthetics of the photographer. All photographers don't have the same aesthetic. Some photographers like long events, some photographers like wide angle. I'm a wide angle shooter. I love wide angle. Because it's more information. A photograph is data, a photograph is information. And I've always even before I I always had these concepts. Why so? You can always, you can add on a picture, but you can always eliminate it. So let's step back for a moment from Chicago. Uh, you mentioned River Road, which I want to come to. So did you go back and forth between Chicago and Mississippi after you left Mississippi? All the time. I still do. And I, I'm in three places. I'm in Chicago, I'm in Mississippi, a little bit of DC, but uh, New Orleans. Those are three, three places where my heart lives. And when I go there, it's like being home. Yeah. We know. We know. I'm going to leave it alone. But I'm, I'm just saying that there are places on earth that you feel home. Cuba, Brazil, Chicago. Those places when you go there, you're reconnecting to a spirit that you left there. I do want to go back to River Road, but now that you mentioned DC, a lot of Chicago that you described from your early childhood, particularly artists and poets, writers, ended up here in DC and you ended up here in DC. It was the migration. It was like the migration from the South, and then it was the migration from D.C. There was a core group of people that worked with Obasi and Walter Speck and Afro Cobra. And then the music, like A.C. went to New York. Mohaw went to New York. Okay, and a lot of the other, Joseph, a lot of them went to New York. Did you keep in touch with the musicians? And once you get into A.C. or Obasi, it's life. Despite that for us, because I mean that was that was really uh, a renaissance. It was a revolution. A lot of stuff was happening across the country. It was a revolution. 
Talk to us about that. Well, all respect was a revolution. AACM was a revolution. Gasoline was a revolution. Revolution here in D.C. I mean, the things that Gaston was doing, he, he, he basically was doing what all the things we were doing in Chicago, right here in D.C., one person. I mean, he had other people were involved. And, and usually, the deal about our deal was that we never saw it as an individual piece, some people did. But mostly we saw it as a group effort. As a group effort. Okay, now, we all want to succeed. We're getting close. We're getting close. So, River Road. Yes. Sir. Talk to us about River Road. River Road runs between the, the end of the tip of the Mississippi River all the way to Chicago. And the road was basically the commercial road for people to travel on for goods and services. And then a lot of the plantations were built off of that road. A lot of the plantations are built off the River Road. So that you got Oak Alley, you've got all these big plantations that were sugar cane plantations. Okay. That are now chemical plants and oil refineries. I call them the new plantation. And so Tom Dick and I. Tell us who Tom Dick was. Tom Dick's dad was uh, president of the dealer. And Tom Dent was like, he was like the poet, lord, musician, writer, the guy you wanted to know if you went to New Orleans and didn't know anybody. He used to come and see me when I worked at the National Endowment for Humanity. Yeah, he, 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 he was a poet, writer, administrator. He was over the uh, Dennis Heritage Foundation at one point. But he was a good friend of mine, and Hort Ford, the person who gave me Tom's number when I moved to New Orleans in 71. So how long were you in New Orleans? About a year. And then I went back to Chicago. So what were you doing down in New Orleans? Oh, I was raising my children. I had my children. And working with Tom on projects. And then we decided in 75 to go on the road to show communities along the river. We got on the road and we began to hear cancer. We kept we interview people to talk to people about what was going on in their community. And we kept hearing cancer, cancer. And so we realized that we were in the middle of what they call cancer corner, which is where a lot of those plants, a lot of those oil refineries are polluting the air and the water. And so a lot of people are dying from cancer. They still are. They still, there's so many plants between Baton Rouge and New Orleans. Like I said, they call it cancer corner. So this was going to be a book exhibition. It did become an ex uh, exhibition that did travel. It, it was in New Orleans during the World Fair in 84. It moved around the country. And I'm hopeful we will finish that book. Who were the photographers who were a little older than you that, in, were there any in particular influences, anybody's work you were following? Or need to sleep, you have any? Roy D. Garrard, Gordon Parks, uh, local photographers in D.C., I mean, in, in Chicago, who worked, we worked together. Uh, Ozier later. Uh, uh, Ozier was Ozier, with Ozier. Ozier was with Ebony. Yeah, I'll just show that. Ozier was with Ebony. He came later. Uh, my man from the defense staff. We all work together as as you decide. That was a Bobby, right? Since that, or, or, or Bobby well, since that. Bobby, Bobby since that. Okay. Bobby since that. And so we all covered. One of the things that we did in Chicago was cover demonstration. We covered demonstration, man. The march. I would really consider the march photographer because I, I mean, it's the science to cover the march, you know. And so I developed that so that you know I was interested in. Uh, being able to cover it so that I can put you there. If you look at the series, you can do that. A science to covering marches. You, right. you did the major coverage of the Mayor Man March here in Washington. Oh, yeah. Talk to us about how that science that was, was That happened. was, I mean, you, you really have to have a strategy. I mean, either you just, you know what you're doing, you know how it's, you know, you know, get the detail, get the facts, get the information. 
So they were, you know, do your research. You know, so if you cover something big, you got to really know what it is, the dynamics, the smoke, you know, what's going to happen, the schedule. You got to know that beforehand, so you know where to be. And so the million man march is a dream. I just said that the dream will come true. The million man march is a dream come true. And I'm so glad I lived long enough to be there, to be there and witness that history. Major, major, major. And I think it was a bright day for the world. I think the technicians and the people who come from arts probably worked harder that day than any other day. It was an honor to be there. You had some years earlier, perhaps decades, that you would tell us that you had covered um, the photography of Elijah Muhammad of the Nation of Islam. Yeah. Could you talk to us about that? Well, you know, I was looking at uh, Muhammad speaking in matches because the paper would come down on the train along with the Pittsburgh Curry, along with Jet. And so I used to go to the temple in Chicago. You know, it was the temple over on Woodland. I, was, I went to the temple, and I, so I actually heard the honor of the teeth. And then in 69, me and Sink was in Claiborne, filmmaker, Black Girl. We were uh, working on a year in film, and we were at the honorable house, and he said he didn't see too many black crews, film crews coming up into the house. And so we looked, I looked at Sink, and I said, we'd love to do a film on the nation. And so, so we did it together. So that, Feb that February we were there filming a 20 minute film on the nation called The Nation Conversation that ran on Black Journal. That ran on, on Black Journal? Yeah, PBS. Well, with NET at the time. St. Clair Boy. Major film. How many people out there know the name St. Clair Boy? Major. Major. That's good. That's good. Major. So we agreed that. Yeah, we, we, uh, we don't get there. No, we don't get there. <laughs> so, one of the extraordinary figures in my life and in the lives of many people was Sterling Brown. Oh. But no one had the relationship, the particular kind of relationship with Sterling Brown that you My wife Mary and I would go spend weekends with Sterling. I'd get a bottle of, we'd get a bottle of 20 for it. Sterling liked to drink some good wine. We would go and he would say, uh, you want to interview me? And hardly. And, 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 and hardly. And hardly. Well, we only drank wine. Dude. And he would have all these broken tape recorders down in the division. He said, go down and get the tape recorders. So I would go down and find some of the tape recorders and we would sit down with it. But you were known as Sterling Brown's photographer, which is an angle into him that many people have written about him, right, have written about his poetry, but I don't know that anyone has the insight, particularly as a photographic reel, as a photo, as a photo documentary, that you have in Sterling. Could you talk to us about Sterling, about the man, and then about your documentation of him? Yeah, it started in Chicago, 65. We're all better with a group of they had a group called the Amstead Group, and they invited Sterling to do a reading in Chicago. And so I met him. I went to the poetry reading. I said, who was this white boy? I said, reading poetry dialect like where I'm from. You know? So when I, found, when I met him, he said, oh, you from that? And he had a very vivid, because him and Ozzy, author, not Arthur P., but him and, him and the historian from the University of Illinois, Davis, Davis from University of Illinois. They went through, and he worked on the Mirador study too. So he worked. He was in the South, working with Mirador on the on the sociological stuff. Got him out of. And he went yeah. through Natchez, in to New Orleans. So he knew Natchez. He knew how complicated Natchez was. You know, with all that money. You know, the hierarchy in Natchez. He knew it. And so, yeah. So once. And then he came to Ellis Bookstore on College Grove the next day, and I met him there. So we became friends. And then in 67, when I had the opening year, he came to my work. So he got to see my work, and invited me to speak to his class. So when I moved here in 73, 
I kind of began to cover him reading here and began to so engage him. What do you need somebody to travel to look after? Daisy was his wife. Daisy was his wife. Right arm, left arm. And so, uh, so we, but that relationship really had kind of been started with Gwendolyn Brooks in Chicago because in order to cover somebody the way I've covered the story, they say you should take no guns of their time to cheat. And, and that means the person has to take trust you. Yeah, because you get into settings where, you know, you, it's a very private situation. And the person has to trust you for you to be in that situation. The person, and to be taking pictures in that situation, that's a whole other thing. You know, and so, trust me. And we, I enjoy traveling with him, the people that I was meeting with him. I mean, it was like all the majors. The major writers, the major artists. And so for me, I mean, I have over 100 dollars of film on Sterling alone. Oh. You know, one of the things about Sterling Brown that it seems to me that a lot of people miss, and all you have to do is just some like, sort of preliminary documentation. In many ways, it's arguable that Sterling Brown might be called the father of black community studies. Uh, Sterling working with the WPA actually went out around the country and did documentation on black communities all over this country. Right. Their language patterns, their religious patterns, uh, their food ways, uh, really scientific sociological documentation. We see it in his poetry, we get the feeling, Butter Beans from Kara and, and, and the little Clara and the Butter Little Fellow running space talking about Virginia out there. Right. Did you cover any of, and, and, and he, he had these interlocutors. Uh, he would go to St. Louis to, to talk to a doorman uh, who, who was a big liar, told these tall tales. Uh, Sterling did his research in reflecting the voice and the sensibilities of people uh, in his, in, in his other simple version. So did you document any of those people that, that he was interviewing? Well, I only, I mean, I was in, that was the 30s, 40s, 50s. But then down on U Street. But you bet that may have done. I mean, I photographed him uh, doing readings. And then, of course, after the readings, which was a real, after the readings was the main, main event after the readings, uh, I got all that. And, and usually, in that story that, that was on Fox, that piece, you saw this piece of him reading from the Negro character at Harvard. That was a microphone. That was my mic. So I recorded Sterling. All these speeches, all these readings, I recorded. All these tapes. One more question about Sterling, and then we're going to go to Best Act. Yeah. There's a photograph, if memory serves me directly, that you took us here. And Sterling was old people and he was in a nursing home. And uh, our youngest son, Jabin, who's I think about 43 years old, Miriam and our youngest son, we went to see him. And Sterling had head full of white hair and a full white beard. But I felt that you were a little awkward about that photograph. Uh, yeah, I, I stopped taking pictures of Sterling. And then this Brooks told me, they wrote, but that's the hardest story. You know, so I wasn't certain that I would not take. But I grabbed a picture of my daughter treating me one. At, 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 at the nursing home. At the nursing home. Yeah. yeah, at the nursing home. Yeah, so I, I took, I did take a few shots. But, I mean, you, you have to begin, you have to, one, know yourself, know the person. And, and I wouldn't do anything that, that he wouldn't want me to take a picture of. Yeah. So I, I, I wouldn't take it. Well, that picture is indelible in my mind. I mean, I can see it right now of um, <coughs> Sterling at that in, in those last years. Well, there were last year. We all gonna have it. <laughs> okay, press that. 
So when Roy and I were talking about this, and he says, you know what, I, I, all this biographical stuff I don't really want to go through. I, I really, one of the key things I want to talk about is Festat. First of all, remind us of what Festat was, and then you got it. <laughs> this is, uh, why, why don't we make the move here? All right. Yeah, we're, we're going to move over here, and then we're going to stop taking pictures. Oh, the slide. They take pictures of me and James. <laughs> but, but the slides. You can't publish them without paying us. Table's okay. Table's okay. We're over here. So the cameras need to be pointed this way. Right over here. So People clear it, no pictures of photographs, please. I think we understand this, right? Yes. So. Lights off. Wait, wait, no, let's see um, about the lights. Uh, Just those two lights. Uh, we, we, have to, we have to get someone okay. to Can you let's see put a picture on, please? Yes, yeah, so the lights are fine. Can you see? Anybody can see the images? Yeah. Okay. Keep it going. Okay. Just hold it right there. So that's just a hair death. So this is the hair death flying over this area of death on the way to Festa. There you go. There we go. There we go. And so that's about as abstract as you can get. <laughs> Painting, whatever. Yeah. And so I, it's almost to me like clouds. I like shooting clouds. I shoot a lot of clouds. When I'm in the plane, I shoot the clouds. And so uh, I looked out the window and there it was. Yeah. Uh, okay. Lower it just a little bit. Wow. Who's this artist out of New York? Who's the photographer? Photographer, okay. And is that Adam Ola? That's Adam Ola. Adam Ola, 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 See? Okay, out of New York. Yeah, this is on the plane. We okay? Let's go up, we okay? Yep. Okay. Yeah, this is on the plane, on the way home. I always like to, a lot of people shoot events starting or events ending, but I like to get the in-between, take you there, you know, so that you, uh, you're part of the trip, okay? We always know what that is. This is the arrival in Lagos. In Lagos. But now remind people of what Festat was. Second World Festival of African Art and Culture. It was the second, uh, the first one was in Senegal. This was in Nigeria in 1977. And we had two planes. The first plane went over, and then the second plane came from over. I think this is the second plane arriving because I'm there. I went out to, we went, the second 
the first plane people went out to, to get on the plane to go back, and it's the second plane coming over. So people, as Minister Farrakhan, and those are the passports of all the people on the second plane. This is how you might go down. Keep going. He's an automotive, and his brother was a drummer. He was also a sound man. He and I worked on several black journal films. Cannot think of his name now, but he's no longer with you. He's an ancestor. A lot of these people are ancestors have gone on, but he was greeting his buddy on a boat. Robin of John Brown, Chicago. Uh, by the way, we all had, uh, each delegation had cars, buses, houses, which you will see later. Scream on the morning back. I'm going to pass for that, yeah. It's okay. Yeah. We, we, we uh, asked yes. a lot of pictures. So this is Queen Mother Moore here. Yes, it is. And keep going. That was the reception area. That was like where you had to go get get to get your check your passport. Get in the country. Had to go through there. This is an area in the village, it's called Festac Village. Yeah. And you see the side, USA, we had about four buildings that were like three, four story high, and we all had apartments. That's the Sabu. Uh, and that's Ed from Studio Museum. And, and we're down at Atlanta. You Atlanta. Might, you, what, what was it? What's, what's the gallery you met in Atlanta? I can't make a gallery, but I know that's Ed's Briggs. Right, yeah, yeah, Ed's Briggs, right. Hammond's house. Hammond's house, yeah, right yes. down, not far from Spelman College. Mm -hmm. Okay, photography. So you see about, I talked about I'm a wide angle shoot. You see what happened with the wide angle is that you can elongate, you can, it's the most sculptural feeling of this, you know. And so I always saw it was at one spot, People wonder why I move so much. This is it, people. This is opening day at the National Theater. This is opening day. Let's keep going. That's a book that, they, that the Nigerian government put out on Festival. And this is one of the chiefs, ceremonial leader, one of the one of the high priests. It's like with an Ogun symbol there. I think it's from, it's from Nigeria. It's one of the other countries, maybe Somalia. Each country had a delegation to Ethiopia.
The idea is to put, the, put you there, that's the U.S. delegation, a part of the U.S. delegation. That was Barbara Ann Teer from New York. In the Spirit House movies. Oh. Barbara Ann Teer in the Spirit House movies. Oh my yeah. goodness. Mm -hmm. United States of America, first step. See, there's a red, black, green. We didn't have an American flag. We did not have an American flag. <laughs> This is at night at the National Theater. That's the actress. What is her name? Oh man. An actress, famous actress. What what movies, what plays? Not not act actress. Right, but theater. Theater. Okay, what plays here? I, I, I okay. That would help us. These, each country had theater groups that performed. And U.S. had theater groups. We had theater groups. The D.C. Rep was from here. That's a gospel group. I don't remember where they were from. See, so you one view, you got to show another view. That's the Iliad Memorial. I think that's the Iliad Memorial. It is. It's the Iliad Memorial. Famous dancer from New York. That's him. Now, now Elio was doing a lot of complaining, and so the press picked that up. I, I had my passport stolen in, in Lagos, and so I had to go to the American Embassy to get my passport. They had all these negative articles on the wall about our participation in the festival. I later talked to him later afterwards, like after the festival. He said he was such an embarrassing for him to, for that to have happened, you know. He, you know, cold water, a lot of people get the cold shower, you know. But you see the level of performance. I mean, this could, yeah, let's keep going. Jazz. This group of some Kenny. Ah, this is Cuba, Uba. And this just dealt with the, the mixture of the Spanish and the African. Let's keep going. Ah, see? The mixture. Ethiopia. That's uh, ETA out of Chicago. That's DZ Rep. Square, which is this, and then one at the gymnasium. So these were performing like they were going on simultaneously. And of course, this was the night they were pulling the hinges off the door at the National Theater, Mary McKee. Yeah. That, that, that's what was happening with that focus there. Go to the next one. Uh, Sister Mary. I mean, that was an exciting night at the National Theater. There we go. Queen of Africa. Dollar Brand. Trinidad, that's the brother from Trinidad. Barrel, there you go. So you see, everybody was there from everywhere. Brother Sunrise. The deal with Sunrise, when Sunrise played, people got up and walked out. The Africans. 
They had never heard, they had heard his music. <laughs> space is place. It's an all-female orchestra. It's colloquial. They're colloquial. That's a uh, great right. Great, so great right. right. So no, no, this is why. Yeah, yeah this, this is why it's an income. Isn't that great? I'm just in Nascimento from Brazil. You see, so the colloquial, you see, they had the real followers, they're getting interpreted. And there was a stack of papers about that high. Ron Walton brought a stack back with him. Yeah, the first stack of papers. Oh, well, uh, now, you remember me mentioning that I was a scientist? This is that actress lady I'm telling you about. I cannot think of her name now. Betty Burroughs. Yes. Betty Burroughs, that's her name. This sister is from Chicago. Angela. Yeah. Poet. This is the art exhibit. Inches away to the art exhibit. See, it was teaching going on. Every day, there was all kinds of different things going on. Each delegation had things to do, I mean jobs to do. Every day they had assignments. And then there was fashion. You'll see a little bit of fashion toward the end. Uh, there was a durable. But this, is, this presentation is really about sort of putting you there, letting you see the dynamics of the piece. That's the opening of the art exhibit. That's Ed, the brother from, from, from New York. He's a sculptor out of New York. Mel, Mel Edwards? Mel Edwards. That's Mel. Audibola. That's my piece up there, my daughter. And then the rest is on a, there's a spender over there. It was a lot to cover, as you can see. So you just had to keep moving. Every day you got up to do something. This is where we had our lunch, uh, where we ate in, those were, those were uh, food areas. We had tickets. And those were food areas that we wouldn't make. Think about that, 16,000 people that they're feeding every day for a month. That's inside of one. Hey. Brother Andy, Andy got the second plane. Hello, we went over the first plane, Jeff. So Jeff, I said, Jeff, if we don't take the first plane, we don't get there, we're not going to be gone. That was Jeff Donaldson. Jeff Donaldson, who was the head North of the American Art Zone. At Howard, he was the North American Zone yeah. chief in charge of Festa USA. Queen Mother Moore. And this guy, this white boy, I mean, he, <laughs> he, he was the ambassador to Nigeria. And we there had a park for at his house. And he actually blew a trumpet. Man, I got ready to leave. I was getting ready to leave. I said, I'm leaving this. I'm going to sit here. I'll be going no trouble. And so Queen Mother Moore said, no, Roy, well, stay. Stay. She ordered me to stay. So I stayed and photographed the whole thing. Queen Mother Moore, you need to Google her. That's David. That's David Stevens. I don't know the sister. I don't remember her name. David was from and Stevie, Brother Stevie. Stevie was so impressed with Festac, he stayed over to receive his Emmy. So they had to film him from Naples receiving his Emmy. This is the symbols of power for this chief. Queen Mother, that's a balcony. A lot of people stayed on the island there where the hotel was suites. 
It's a lot of VIPs staying on the island. That's not just like who. Stevie, Stevie. Yeah. Oh, that's It's the inside. You see? Yeah. You get to feel it. Okay, yeah. so I also do other things. You know? yeah. This is one for my spirit. Mm -hmm. I'm just looking out the window. The brother there he is down there in the boat. But very seldom you see those kind of pictures of me. People don't see them. And this is the traffic. And there goes the traffic so bad. The even numbers on one day, odd numbers on the other day. License plates. Wow. Yeah, it, is, it, is, it is quite a now, city. Now, now you place. see the boulevard. You see those houses? We had about four or five of them. At least four. Were those built for the so, The whole village, Festac Village, was built for Festac. And I, that's just a housing development now. That's all the tombs on the tomb. Is this Rex Lapo? Oh, yeah. I mean, oh, you know, yeah. Wow. The idea is to show you some of the people, some of the things that you would see if you were there. And a lot of the vendors came in. That's uh, that's Frank Smith in the center, and, and David Stevenson, and then the brother. Uh, I think that's uh, who was Wadsworth Gerald, and then the brother with the shirt is one of the dancers. Is that Jeff? Jeff Thomas. Yes. And Andrew Young. Oh, okay. Check out Jeff. Yes, <laughs> that's one of his tools. Yeah, thing. <laughs> so vendors would bring their goods to where we were because we, we had the U.S. dollar. Everybody looking for the U.S. dollar. Documentation. You, you photograph everything. You see, you photograph everything because it's all important. That's that good. And that was real. And so that, that means that was tied into the whole system yes. of Festnet transportation. That was one of the buses. And then we had the smaller buses. His son, Ron. Ted Jones, the other guy with the cab was Ted Jones. What's that brother name? Ed, go back. And what's his name? Ed? Andy Shane. Huh? Andy Shane and Jay Stewart. Right. Uh, right. You see the meal didn't get it. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm here? The meals. The meals. There's Stevie and Knight in the village. Stuff happened at night. <laughs> oh, a lot of stuff. <laughs> this is, who, this is, uh, who is this? I think he traveled with, uh, with Stevie. He was with Stevie. Stevie, he, I guess Stevie could feel it. This is, I think this is uh, Taylor's place. Yeah. This is the shrine. Oh, wow. This is the shrine. Now, the first night I was there, the Brazilian, a Brazilian group, they just captured me, they just took me. They said, come, you go with us. And I, I don't speak Portuguese, so I just went with them. And they went to Favors. It was the first night we went to Favors. Of course, we went back as a delegation. We went back, we went back. We spent a lot of time in Favors. Next slide. Now, that may be Favors, but that also could be in the village. The, the, the place where we ate food in the daytime became so like discos at night. Something for us to do. That's her. And Miss Farrakhan. Yeah. Uh -huh. Do I need to go back? Uh-oh. Go back. Go back. You know, you have to have go back. You gotta have one slide up side. That's James King. Man. That's a heavy photograph. That's James King. You're a James, well, I'm not going to do this. I'll, 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 
Okay, next up slide, down slide. You gotta have one. And it's interesting, this was like a water piece where they had this whole thing from the east where, go to the next slide. Oh, it's okay. Anyway, they passed and reviewed these books. They had a little bit for every, everything that dealt with culture and history. I mean, from all over the world. I mean, you could see the dynamics of our culture. There in that, what, 30, 29 days, the wrong bit, called the 29 days that shook the world. Okay, now you see this up. This is from the east, and it was uh, it's a sort of like a flotilla of boats in review, you know, that they got all this stuff means something that, of course, I know a little about. But I just know that this was a, a day where the fish were going out and watched the boats go by. There was all this meant something. It was competition or whatever. A so lot of stuff you didn't know. So let's, let's hold on. So you said Lerone Bennett described it as? The 29 days that shook the world. It's, it's an editorial in the Ebony magazine I have here. This magazine is 1960, 1977. The Ebony magazine, 1977. The editorial is the wrong Bennett wrote. It's called 29 Days That Shook the World. It's a beautiful essay. People. Uh, the Kenty Club, that's January. January, I'm always here. Yeah. Here in Washington. There's another piece that I ran on her that was in the Ebony, the fashion show of her in that Kenty. It was a closer shot of her, but they ran it in Ebony. This was a single photograph of January Mosier or an essay? This is a single, no, 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 no. What I'm saying is, they included her in the spread on the Ebony in the fashion show. Because they had a big fashion show from all the different countries had their fashion. Oh man, that's another one I put up. I should have checked that. Sorry about that. It, it's, it's, it's a Durba. The Durba was in northern Nigeria. And it's, it was a military operation. All these guys are military. And they're riding these Israeli stash of uh, uh, These They come and charge the stand. I mean, I literally had pictures of horses just running straight toward the stand. And they call them. It's in the ebony spread. You could go online. This ebony is online. That ebony is online. This is toward the end. This is the, the closing day. Everybody's kind of getting their gifts together to go out. And uh, a lot of this, this is an edited version of my presentation. So this is not the whole piece much longer. But this works, and this is a party in favor. I know that's in favor, but that you can see in the background. That's a stage. That's a stage. I thought I'd end with that because it's a celebration. Good, 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 good. So we're going to come to you in just a moment. So no, no, no. Uh, just a, one comment and then one question to Roy before we come to you. you know, I went to uh, Ambassador Howard G. Dibble, uh, some South Carolina African American whom I had gone to Morehouse with. Uh, he lives here in Washington, D.C. called me to come to Nigeria. Uh, in uh, 2001, that's the first time I went to Nigeria to speak at the Center for African, I think, in the Diaspora or something of that sort. And so I went to a, a huge building with all of this Vestac material, huge uh, film and stuff, these big canisters, you know, like this big around, and about a half a foot of water. It was just really, really tragic. I found ID badges of some of the people from the U.S. delegation. None of them were organized. This, this was in, in Nigeria. And this, I went in 2001. I was on my way to the World Conference. This is a national theater because I heard about the floors. Yeah, and, and, and water was just, it was really, really tragic. It also brings to mind, and Niani could help me think about this as well, that when we did the African Diaspora program with the late Gerald Davis, who came up with that concept, he was a black folklorist, he was a graduate student 
of working as an associate director at the Smithsonian Folk Life Festival, but as a graduate student. They brought in Bernie Striegan, who was also a PhD candidate at Howard University. Uh, I was halfway a PhD candidate at Howard University in the history department with her, but we all went in and, and did the African diaspora program. But we did not make these connections. This is one of the things that I think we have to think about um, when we think about Roy Lewis. We don't make these connections. Like I'm already thinking, what would it take to finance the production of these 100 rows of film of Sterling Brown? You know, why isn't the Library of Congress here? Why isn't the African American, National African American Museum Photography Department here? Uh, why is not the DC Council for the Arts or the Humanities? Well, the why has got to be answered by us. And so we need to go to them and we need to push Roy to get some of this other material out, particularly for this newer generation of both photographers in our community and for institutions in in our community. So I want to end before we come to you with one last question, but it may run into two or three answers with Roy. So who financed you? Who supported you to do this work at Best Act? Uh, well, I was a member. I mean, I was an artist, so I got my ticket from that, but nobody paid me. Uh, National Geographic actually processed my colorful. Because what happened is their photographer had to go back to New York because he had did a special issue on Harlem. And so their writer said, well, look, when you get back, we want to see what you show. And so the reason why I was able to keep shooting color was because their photographer met the writer in Kaduna up there where he saw horses. And he brought back a, a truck full of film. He said, get where you need. So I was able to continue to shoot film. I was basically out of color. And so I was able to continue to shoot it. And I gave them a 60-year-old color film. And they processed it. And then they used, put my name on the slide, each slide. And then the other, they used anything. But they looked at it. And I got the film, which means I was able to submit to edit so that they had, because I had stuff that uh, Ozier didn't have. Because he was, you couldn't be in one place. You know, there's so much going on. So you really needed two or three photographers or something like that. You know, I mean, even while you were in National Theater, there could be something going on uh, over at, at the Telewife of Eagle Square or at, at the gymnasium. You know, it was an Olympic of culture. It was an Olympic, a African Olympic of our culture from everywhere. Oh, that's it. So what is Larry Neal coming here? Larry Neal. Who's, who, who, know, who out here doesn't know who Larry Neal was? Raise your hand. Well, All right, so everybody out here for the most part. Larry and I were going to do the book of the 60s. I gave Larry like 10 points. The Wall of Respect, John Coltrane, Elijah Muhammad, and a couple of others. And he wrote uh, poetry, poems to those. And it's said to the Schomburg. It said to the Schomburg. It said his papers. Those I have the original, I have copies of those poems that he wrote. The poems that that he wrote in response to my my photographs. So Larry Neal, who knows Black Fire. So this and this is the aesthetic. major documentation and that opens aesthetic. up the, the, the yes, the whole black aesthetic, the, the black arts movement. Uh, Larry Neal and Leroy Jones and Mary Baraka. And Larry Neal then comes here and becomes the commission with the first DC commission on the arts under Washington. And when I came back from FESTA, I sit in a bedroom, which I was in, in, in a friend's house, and showed them FESTA. Like these slides. Now, but I showed them a version of FESTA. Oh, a footnote. Uh, I said, Stevie Wonder people, Steve Wonder Morris, Stevie Wonder name is Steve Morris. And he sent me a letter, or had his people send me a letter requesting slides of Festa. I detailed 80 slides, description of each slide, and sent it to Stevie did a, a slide presentation on Festa in California. Stevie did a slide. He did. And he did. I mean, you know, he sent me, you know, I sent him. 
itemize each slide, what, where, when, but they, and he had that turned to Braille, and he read the slide and showed the slide. And he paid me $400 for it. But, but I'm just saying, uh, I always have a feeling when I go on assignments, I shoot probably more than I should, because I'm always thinking that there are people who can't be there. And I feel responsible to those people. And the community, I, I'm always an uh, ad, advocate for the community. I'm their representative. You know, I'm, in, I'm their man in the, inside, outside. By the way, for all the people who think I'm still not got it, this, this is a recent couple, last, last year. This is J6. So for the people who think that, Oh, he just a guy 10, 50 years ago. <laughs> this last year. And basically it was me covering J6 yes. for this magazine. I've been working with this magazine. My first issue with this magazine was on Mary Barry when he ran after being locked up and ran and got reelected. The story was called The Resurrection of Mary Barry. So I've kept, I've continued to work. You know, I've continued to work. I can't work, I can't be everywhere anymore, but I'm still being there, and uh, photography is something that I love to do, I've always loved to do it, it's a way of life, and I enjoy it. I mean, I, the only other thing that I possibly even thought about you know, was being an architect, I don't know where that comes from, maybe I'm a mechanical drawing class in, in high school, but questions? So we didn't come to the Washington Informer. That would be for our next discussion because uh, the Washington Informer. Well, that's I just got you saying that I'm still working. I work at the Washington Informer. Okay. Work at the so, that, so that's a whole another DC chapter that we need to get into. That's but true. now is your time. We've got about 12 minutes or so. Yeah, or so. Okay. So uh, let's take let's take like maybe three people at a time. Your you make your either comment or question, and uh, and then Roy will respond. I have a microphone. Over here. I'm coming to the phone. I'm going to get the camera. But I want you producers out there, your programmers out there, to think about the D.C. Commission for the Arts, the Humanities Council, the National Endowment. Uh, we really need to get some of this other million copies of work that Roy has. And we've only covered a small number of essay, essay kinds of topics uh, in his work today. So this is a question from Lynn Dyson, the director. No, no, it's for me. Oh, OK. My name is Ngozi Yawas. I'm from Nigeria. I just want to find out, did you ever find your passport? <laughs> no, I got reissued another one. Oh, somebody in this country called Oh, no, no, no. I know what happened. It happened in the National Theater. I was in the lot, I was in the restaurant at the, at the cafe in the National Theater and I left my bag sitting with some of these USA people and they got up and left my bag there. So there's one of those people who, who was watching what was going on, went there, went in the bag and they take up and they used to play with the passport. You gotta take a passport to Legos and it's worth a lot of money. Yes. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, yes, my Train Institute, but I was there with the DC Black Rep. I lived all of that, and so I have a, a commitment to you, Mr. Lewis, and you know, everybody that's on here. That my organization will go to the National Down with the Humanities, National Down with the Arts, the DC Commission. Let's look at do we want to do a Sterling Brown, we can do a Fest Act, we do a combination of all those things of the work of the great Roy Lewis that needs to be documented for the legacy of the generation to come. Excellent. 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 Other questions or comments? Roy, uh, we met through the National Conference of Artists, and you are an inspiration to me and many younger photographers. Um, to me, you are everywhere. Anything that's going on in the area, you are there documenting, and it's wonderful. Of your million photographs, and I know this is going to be a difficult thing, but from your inside spirit, 
I'm curious to know what are three photographs that you remember that have been the most inspirational or memorable to you? Well, uh, yeah, there's one I took in Chicago in about 1967 on 31st Street. Uh, a young man hold, with his baby sitting in his lap. The baby, he had a diaper bag in front of him on the sidewalk, and the baby was in his lap. I called it father and son. And that to me was one of my most, because I thought it represented an image of black men that was not in the media. It was an image of black men as a human being. And so that's one of the pictures if I was going to see well, what's going to represent your work. That's one. And then I've got what of Ali running in Zaire. He felt like I was out on the road with Ali trying to walk, run with him. You know, I said, ridiculous. I got back in the car. I went about a mile down the road and let him come to me. So I call it Stur uh, Ali, Muhammad Ali, strong man, keep coming. And, 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 and there are other pictures. Uh, I, I guess some of the media man large pictures. I've got a million man march picture of a guy who looked like Jesus. I mean, he's literally, I mean, the way he looked, the angle, he looked like Jesus, 20, 1995. You know, he was just there in the crowd, and I saw it, and I said, okay, that looks like Jesus. And so that. And there are other pictures. I don't really, I'm not a one person photographer. I, I get into the series, the narrative. I try to cover, and, the event or the, or the situation. A lot of times I just start shooting. I like to shoot like from four to five or six because the light is the best light in the world between four, 4.30 and 5.30, six o'clock. It's the best light in the world because it's the, the red in there. Is, if you can't create it in the studio, that's the time I like to shoot. And once I start a sequence, I'll shoot until it's finished. Uh, what's your name, sister? Anna Maria. Which, that's your full name? Allen. Anna Maria Allen, and you're one of, and you're a photographer here in the Washington area. Yes. Okay, very good. Other yeah, questions are coming. Former president of the National Conference of Artists and Local Chapter. Very good. A very another very important organization that if you're not aware of it. You should know about its history and its contemporary engagements. Boy, this has been um, a special occasion, I think, for all of us. Uh, wow. I think we... We're finishing early. I think, well, are we finishing early? Yeah. Uh, my, uh, producer? I think that uh, we're supposed to start around 8 o'clock, but sometimes... Oh, we have nine minutes. Right, we can, we, can, we can talk a little bit more. Uh, well, Boy's going to talk a little more. Well, then, I think, I think, I'm going to interview you. I'm going to interview you now. Okay, James. Okay, James. Now, you made the transition from Howard Institute of Arts and Humanities. Howard. Howard University Institute of Arts and Humanities. Right. To Smithsonian. Well, to the National Endowment for the Humanities. And then to the Smithsonian. Well, actually, see, see. Well, actually it started like this. So I came here in 1971 in August. Uh, Bernice Johnson Reagan and I came as Ford Foundation Fellows to work on PhDs. Uh, Vincent Harding, who had written the Vietnam speech for Dr. King, Vincent Harding founded Institute of the Black World in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, was working with Mrs. King on the Martin Luther King Documentation Project. And he put a condition that he wanted to develop this Institute of the Black World. I'd been thrown out of Morehouse. Uh, we took over the administration building. I did have, I finished all my coursework, but I was out there floundering because I didn't have a career path. Vincent Harding heard that I needed a job. Uh, he sent for me, gave me a job as an archivist working on snake papers. I didn't know what the term archivist meant, but, but I worked on snake papers in the International Theological Seminary there. And then one day he said, I think you ought to go to graduate school and um, go up to the Ford Foundation. This was a big, after the rebellions. You know, they were giving black people yeah. money everywhere. Well, you could do that. You would get these letters from Harvard. You know, uh, some black students said, "Well, I can name you five people in 
they would send you a letter saying, do you want to do a PhD in education at Harvard? It, it was just dropped from the sky. Well, Bernie Stein got these, um, these five-year grants, but we did, not, we did not have a school. So Vincent called Lorraine um, Williams. Williams here, who was head of the history department at Harvard University. And I said, I got these two students. And I remember Bernie saying to me after about six weeks here, she says, you know, I think these people think that we're two country bumpkins from the South. <laughs> and Bernice had introduced me to the Smithsonian where she had been working. Bernice had done the first interracial folk festival documentation in the South. She had done all kinds of, you all know who the extraordinary of Bernice Johnson Radio is, right? Oh, yeah. Emphasize her because she's been the moving hand and my what turned out to be a career, that's not what I was seeking. Um, Howard Johnson, uh, former head of the Schomburg, uh, and also the Morton Sunnyvark Research Center later in his life, met someone at the National Dom Movie Manager. He said, we have almost no non-white professionals. Need somebody who might come in here and raise a little hell. He says, I think I got the person for you. I asked Andrew Billingsley, who was vice president for academic affairs, a renowned black sociologist on the black church, for a two-year leave of absence from Howard. Uh, because when I dropped out of graduate school at Howard, the next week, Stephen Henderson hired me at the Institute of the Arts and Humanities. Mm -hmm. With Sterling Brown, Heike Matabute, John Oliver Killens, Ethelbert Miller. Uh, it was just an extraordinary uh, incidental life development. That I was involved in at the time. And you, 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 the you were doing the documentation. Bernice, uh, doing our graduate work, Miriam and I were on our Honeymoon, she says it was a research trip in Guyana at the first Carafesta. Uh, introduced me to the Smithsonian folk who wanted to talk to the Cubans, but none of them spoke Spanish. My undergraduate degree is in Spanish. And then I came back and she said, The Smithsonian wants to meet with you. I didn't really know what the Smithsonian was. And the Smithsonian really did not want to meet with me. They didn't know what the hell I was. It was Bernice Regan saying, They need to meet you. And we started working there on contract as graduate students. My first contract with the Smithsonian in 1972, 73, uh, I went to Brazil because Gerald Davis in a meeting said, um, we're doing this African diaspora program and at the end of the meeting, first of all, I didn't know what the diaspora meant at that time. <laughs> but after about five minutes of conversation, I thought, okay, it means dispersion because then in, those, in that era, people only talked about the Jewish diaspora. That was not a term. You know, there was no Guatemalan diaspora, Nigerian diaspora, that was, there were no diaspora studies programs. And so he turned to me at the end of the meeting, he says, and next year we want you to go to Brazil. And I thought, these people think Brazilians speak Spanish. <laughs> uh, that may not have been what was on his mind, but I had to do a second language as a PhD student. So I immediately enrolled with Frank Snowden's daughter, Frank Snowden Blacks in Western Civilization. Uh, his daughter taught Portuguese. I picked up Portuguese very quickly because of my Spanish background. And boom, I was, I got a contract at Smithsonian. And it just started rolling from there. So my life has been sort of just leaning forward and leaning into the So a little everywhere. Yeah. yeah. All right. So Every that, that mean, should have taken up nine minutes now. Right? Everywhere. I mean, you, I mean, what I could see, because a lot of the things that I was photographing were involved in. You know, I was covering a lot of those folk life festivals, you know, and covered this institute. So you were there. I know at the beginning of the institute, working with the Stephen. And, and as quiet as it kept, that was an important look at look at some of the pictures recently. That was an important period. An extraordinary period. It's Stephen Henderson, uh, black militant writers in America with um, Mercer Cook. Mercer Cook was an interlocutor between the negritude writers Leon Damas Senghor and Amy Césaire with the American public. Uh, Steve wrote Black Military Writers in America. I remember uh, Mary Baraka would come to see him. All these writers would come to see him. And uh, Steve was a short guy. He had been my, he's from Key West, Florida. Uh, he had been my head of the English department at Morehouse when I was there and, and taught me. And we spent a lot, a lot of time together. He is also the co-founder of the Institute of the Black World in Atlanta, Georgia, with Vincent Harding. People think it was just Vincent Harding, but Vincent Harding actually wrote that the co-founders of the Institute for Black World were he and Stephen Henderson. Steve hired me a week after I dropped out, and um, it was Neonie Kilkenny and Ethelbert Miller who really put me in the, in the public space here in D.C. So 
I like you got sort of embedded in the community because other people said, wow, you know, I think maybe you we'll were doing the work. Well, they were doing the work and they saw something in me that I was trying to figure out. You had the potential to do the work. <laughs> so you have documented a lot of stuff. One of our favorite pictures, Miriam, is our favorite pictures in the the Museum of African Art when it was on a, on a, in a house on Capitol Hill that the stupid Smithsonian undersecretary's name, for, excuse me for the moment, I wish I could call his name for the record, sold that house because that was Frederick Douglass's oh. real house. Was that and, Ripley? No, no, no this, the this was, uh, the uh, his, I can't think of his name for the moment. I wish I could because I'd like it this is on the record. Mm. A number of us struggled to try to stop the Smithsonian from selling that house Said, okay, turn it into a, a visiting scholar's house. Right. They sell it to some insurance company or something. I think they put a plaque in there. But at the, um, I forget the sister's name who was running that museum that helped me with She's in Chicago. Dickerson? Amina Dickerson. Amina Dickerson. Amina Dickerson was running the, uh, the, the Museum of African Art before it became a part of the Smithsonian. And our youngest son, there is a picture of Miriam, yeah, Hope, no, no, our oldest son, see how yeah. memory. And you shot that photograph and uh, capturing the beautiful Miriam and the handsome John here. Yeah. And so, so, yeah, you've been a part of documenting, and we have all kinds of photographs of your documentation along with another really important uh, documentarian here in the city, and that's Roland Freeman. Right. Um, who is has some health problems, but it has a huge collection that we also need to bring back to the public space here in DC, and particularly engaging with young this younger generation of photographers. Um, so, um, anyway, that's my story. It's been a, I think I think that I'm glad that I asked the question. <laughs> Me too. Because that needed to be said on this stage. One of the things about this room that I like was a celebration that you and your wife had here. When you retired or you stopped working at the Smithsonian or something, I don't know what that was. But it was a celebration. And I enjoyed it because the room is set up in a way that you can do this kind of piece. You know, I recommend this room. And I couldn't wait to get out of this room because it was never, I don't, you know, all of my jobs, they came to me. I, I really have been fortunate uh, that I never look for a job. Someone always called and says, we got something and somebody said, and you know, with a one degree in the Spanish language, you know, although I'm a PhD dropout, I got all these jobs. So when I quit, um, Miriam and I flew out to California to see our youngest son, I think, in a play, and I think it was a Thursday or Friday, I got off the plane and I said to Miriam, today was my last day at the Smithsonian, she said, what? I had been talking to the pension people because I was about to smack this young boy <laughs> that they had, uh, and I'll call him by his name, Michael, what, uh, what is his last name? Michael, uh, Mark. 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 No. 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 Mason. Mason. Michael Mason, and if you run across him, he is a pathological liar out of And we had been looking for a younger generation because some of us were aging and we thought we need new young leadership. Right. And I thought, what am I doing here fighting every day? And I've been there 31 years or so. And so I got on the plane, and I said, today was my last day. And we were staying at a friend's house. I opened up my computer, and I sent out a letter all over the Smithsonian uh, that today was my last day. And I said why I was quitting. Now, I had been talking to the pension people. So <laughs> I, I knew what trigger days would be, and I never went back. I mean, I took two weeks going back to take to take all the books out of my office. But so I quit slash uh, uh, resigned. And my wife said, you know, Karen Spellman said, called me and said, you know, we should do something because Mary and I used to hang out with Karen and AD uh, when they were still not yet. Yeah, they were living in Atlanta, and Miriam and I were dropped in on them. And um, so Miriam really wanted to celebrate this, and I was squirming here saying, I gotta get out of here. Uh, it was a good day, Bernice was here, my, my running buddy Danny Glover came, and so there were elements I enjoyed, but I just wanted to ease on, ease on down the road. And so I was trying to ease on down the road. Well, sometimes, sometimes you gotta sing a little song. 
We, yeah. we started this with a song. What was our song? What did we start? We were talking about what was our song? You, 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 you were imp improvising. You said, um, about slow up, slow down. Slow down. Slow up. Slow up. Slow down. It's time for us to close. <laughs> it's been so great. Glad you all came out. I hope you learned something. And, uh, it really, it really, I've been here since 73, and I'm sure that a lot of you learned some things that you thought you knew, but now you know. You don't have to think about it anymore. Now you know. Thank you all for coming. I had a good time. So, you should come up and ask Roy to sign these things because it's a very important document for you to pass on to people in your younger people in your community, your children, your grandchildren. We're, Thank you. We're so honored to have had this this evening. The, the history was, it was just so important to share. Uh, we also want to acknowledge some of the people that are in the room is we really brought a, we brought a delegation with you. Uh, we have Leonie Kilcane, who spent some years, Miriam, Jane Jones' wife. Is some other people with you that have produced for some years? Bill for Jackson. Yes, oh, I'm yes. sorry. I didn't, we didn't get produced. We got the Washington Post in the room. We have the Washington Post in the room. Yeah, call out your names. Uh, okay. Joe Davidson with the Washington Post. We have the Netta Bean. And from the uh, Africa. African Association of Black Journalists. And weren't you around the end of, uh, with Sylvia Hill's group? Yeah, I wasn't in the group. Okay, all right. The Washington Informer. Yeah. All right. Roy still works with us. Right, and, we, and you all need to do a forum just on his work at the Washington Informer. I had it on my notes, but yeah. we didn't we get to it. Yeah. Okay. Care, I also want to acknowledge, I'm sorry. Vera Tompkins. Vera Tompkins. Okay. We also have the bus for the staff. Here is in the house. Yeah, here is in the house. Here is in the Association Hayroy. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. How are you doing? You said the National Association Hayroy. Oh, yeah. It is here. All right. Okay. Yeah. And we also want to acknowledge bus for the staff. We have Alicia Burns, who is the bus for the staff. We have Jim Giannino who is the press person that, um, the, now the IT person. Thank you, thank you and, for and taking care of us. Uh, uh, Tracy, Tracy Barwick, he's the assistant. We Tracy. appreciate uh, all your help. And please speak to Vice President uh, of Bus Boys and Ports, Alicia, Alicia Berg. We just came back from Cuba last week uh, with 28 people, most of whom had never been to Cuba. I've been going for the last 47 years or so. But West Boys and Poets is named in honor of Langston Hughes, who you know may know the story. Um, Vashon Lindsay, who was in the reigning sort of U.S. poet, was at a downtown Luff Luff restaurant. And uh, Langston Hughes, this extraordinary genius, who had to work by donations from his white women patrons, who, patrons who would take, here's $300, but $300 could take him a long way, pay his rent feed him maybe four or five months, and he, all, they get, all they needed to do was write. But he was working as a busboy at this restaurant, and as he was cleaning the table for, for Vashon Lindsay, he left one or two napkins with poems on it. The next day in the major, um, whatever the major newspaper here in Washington was, Vashon Lindsay said, yesterday I met a great American poet. He is a Negro busboy. So Busboys and Poets is named in commemoration of him. In 1927, he went to Cuba, working on the on a merchant marine ship. This extraordinary genius, talking about the life of everyday people. Just be simple, the profundity of the sayings of ordinary rent parties and things like this. So he gets off the boat and steps right into the literary scene in Cuba. Nicolas Pinyan, who later becomes a revolutionary poet of Cuba, he says to him, after some engagements, I think you should consider using more of the music of the Cuban Negro in your poetry. That year, Nicolas Guillen 